pattern of proteins, I can now understand how it is that I can make retinal cells. If I take an undifferentiated cell, known as a stem cell, and I need retinal cells, I would love to know how to turn that on and make retinal cells so that when I am going blind from macular degeneration, I have a replacement. That's a really exciting area. That's pretty cool. Okay? So one of the things that we would love to know are the answers to those questions and the specific activation of specific genes that give us tissues that we need. Okay? Make sense? I see a few more nods. I guess that's good. Okay, so these elements we're going to see are very odd, okay? They're very odd compared to prokaryotes. Prokaryotes have things that are relatively close, and they're usually at a fairly fixed distance away, minus 10, minus 35. An upstream element might be found 5 or 10,000 base pairs away from the start site of transcription. Five or 10,000 base pairs away. You say, how in the world can it do that? Okay. Not only do we find it five or 10,000 base pairs ahead of the gene, in some cases we can find it five or 10,000 base pairs downstream from the gene. That is, after the gene, not in front of it. It might even be in the middle of the gene. Okay. So how is it that these things do? How is it that these things work? And there is some complexity to them, but your book actually has uh, a nice figure sort of showing how they do things. Okay? And I'd like to show you that. And that is right here. Oh, sorry. That's not it. Sorry. That's not it. Ah, uh, come on. Here we go. All right. So here is um, an element. And another, another term for these elements are called enhancers. So these, and I'll give you the definition for an enhancer in a second. But an enhancer is being bound by a specific transcription factor. A transcription factor, of course, is a protein that's binding a specific DNA sequence and having effects on transcription. So a transcription factor, in this case, is binding to this enhancer. This transcription factor is specific for a specific tissue. And look and see what it does. This thing might be five or 10,000 base pairs away. It actually facilitates the bending of DNA so that it can get close to the Tata box and help the RNA polymerase to get started making RNA. Okay? So distance isn't a big problem if you can bend the DNA and get things where you need it to be. That's pretty darn cool. You think about it, DNA is kind of bent in chromosomes anyway, right? We think about the coiling of the coiling of the coiling of the coiling of the coiling. Maybe some of the coiling of the coiling puts two things together that weren't otherwise very close together to begin with. That might be why we see these things long distances or even variable distances away. Does that make sense? OK, so I said I'd give you a definition for an enhancer. All right? An enhancer is a sequence element that is involved I'm sure it shouldn't evolve. That is, a, that is a variable distance away from the start site of transcription. An enhancer is a sequence element that's a variable distance away from the start site of transcription. We see enhancers in eukaryotes. We don't really see them in prokaryotes, despite what your book says. Okay. When I say variable, what does variable mean? It means that an enhancer for a gene, I might have an enhancer. I'll give you an example. Let's say I talk about troponin. So troponin is this, this muscle protein that my muscles have to have, right? I've got different types of muscle. I've got smooth muscle. I've got striated muscle, right? They might have different tissues. They might have different transcription factors. One of them for the um, striated muscle might have an enhancer that binds a sequence right here. And the other one that works in smooth muscle might have an enhancer that works over here. We see that there's not one control. There's different controls for different tissues. And those are variable regions away. That's what I'm trying to tell you variable means. Okay? For every cell in the body, this particular sequence could be in the same place. Some tissues are going to have a transcription factor that activate it. Some are not. 
Okay, slow down at this point. I can see that. Questions? Speaking it's a good time to get mom to the pop quiz, I think, right? Yes. It's a very good question. How does it work if it's in the middle of the gene? It turns out, it's a, that's a very good thought. It turns out that in the middle of the gene, it's not a problem because it's only involved in activating initiation. Once initiation gets started, it lets go and everything's fine. Okay, everybody understand all that? Yes, sir. Does it fall after, after, after initiation? In fact, it does, yes. So all these things are involved in getting, it, getting the process started, getting initiation going. Once, we've, once we're at the initiation phase, then we move into elongation, and we talk about termination. We're not going to talk about termination here, although there are some very cool mechanisms that eukaryotes use. I'll probably have a lot, about 20 people at my office on Monday saying, Kevin, can you tell us more about those termination mechanisms in eukaryotes, right? Yes, ma'am. The bending uh, is a very good question. Um, the bending uh, is, as you might imagine, a, a variable in this. Okay? So when we look at uh, biomolecules, they are fluid. They are flexible. They are, there is Brownian motion. There is random motion that moves things around. In the case of something in a chromosome, I like to envision these coils of coils being brought into close proximity to each other as a result of that, so that the bending that's depicted here, which looks like it's a very elaborate process, is more of a proximity issue than it is a, um, a, a physical bending with that, okay? So uh, the physical bending is, is, is mostly a schematic for how that would work. They're not always, in, yeah, they're not always in close proximity, no. So like I said, five or 6,000 base pairs away is, is a pretty decent distance. Physically, oh. Yeah, um, I would say that in general, they're not as far apart as they would seem, if that, if that helps, okay? Be, but the fact that they are variable, I mean, says that something is going to be closer, you know, one that's 1,000 nucleotides away is obviously closer than one that's 6,000 nucleotides away. Okay, makes sense? People don't like that, okay. All right, well, let's move on. Um, we're not going to uh, go through too much of the details of that. Um, I want to show you one orchestration. And no, I'm not going to expect you to memorize the steps in this. But I want to show you this orchestration about how transcription is activated in eukaryotes to give you an idea, again, of the complexity. All right? So here's a Tata box, a Tata box that is uh, going to serve as a sort of docking site for proteins to come and activate transcription. Here's the Tata box, OK? The Tata in, in eukaryotic uh, transcription, and by the way, there are many different classes of eukaryotic genes, so that not all of them even go by this particular mechanism I'm going to show you here, OK? This is one example of an orchestration of transcription. Transcription factors, I said, were proteins that recognize these control elements, sequence elements, Tata box being one, that activate Okay, that activate transcription. So I've got a transcription factor is a protein that recognizes and binds to one of those elements. Transcription factors have an abbreviated name. We call them TFs. So TF stands for transcription factor, and TF2 stands for a transcription factor for RNA polymerase 2. If there's one factor you should know from what I'm telling you, it's TF2D. It's the first one. TF2D is a multi-complex protein itself. And TF2D contains one of its factors, that is one of the proteins within it, that recognizes and binds to the Tata box. So this is a very, very early step in this orchestration that brings together and makes transcription happen. So TF2D contains a protein. I'm going to give you the name of the protein as well. It contains a protein that recognizes the Tata box and binds to it. The protein that it contains is called the Tata binding protein, or TBP. 
TBP is a protein of the multi subunit TF2D transcription factor. Now, the rest of what I'm going to show you here, you're not responsible for. You can sit and relax if you want. Okay? People like that. Okay? Now you can see a few smiles on the faces. All right. So, TF2D comes in, and we see other transcription factors. Here's TF2A, here's TF2B, uh, here's TF2E, here's TF2F. A variety of these things come in, and we can see that these things come together, and they do two things. One is they provide stability for the binding of other transcription factors there. So in some cases, some of these factors like TF2B binds to TF2D, which means that TF2D has to be there first. Then after we get some of these guys together, only after we've assembled a complex do we get the RNA polymerase itself in. And what we remember from DNA replication is that once we get the replication protein there, which is the polymerase in this case, we have to start unwinding the strands. So we have proteins that perform those functions as well. We're not going to go into the complexity of those like we did in DNA replication. These things have to happen sequentially. If they don't happen sequentially, then transcription doesn't work. Okay? But one of the last things that has to happen is the RNA polymerase has to become phosphorylated before the, the overall process gets started. So we see phosphorylation of the RNA polymerase, and the polymerase moves along and starts making RNA. Okay? Now, that's a real quick and dirty. There are, there are entire graduate courses taught on eukaryotic transcription. Uh, so you could imagine that was a pretty quick description of what happens in eukaryotic, description, uh, eukaryotic transcription. But it is complex. Um, I think that's the, the, the nuts and bolts of what I'd like you to know. Okay? And that last orchestration, we're not going to worry about. Yes? Sure. So the, the Tata box, the, the Tata binding protein, that's the TBP, is a component of the TF2D transcription factor. So it's a component, and the TBP is what recognizes and binds to the Tata box. So if you take the TBP out of the TF2D, nothing binds. Okay? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So that's what's going on there. Uh, let's see here. What else do we have? There's some response elements. Um, these things are involved in other things. This is, a, this is a glucocorticoid. This is a hormone. Okay, When certain hormones, glucocorticoids, for example, are present, they stimulate uh, the production of a protein that recognizes sequences like this. Okay, Here's a protein that is uh, involved in another type of signaling in the cell that we'll actually talk about later uh, in the uh, term. Heat shock. Heat shock's a very cool one, okay? Um, I didn't talk about it with prokaryotes, but we see a heat shock proteins involved in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And I want to say just a brief word about that, okay? So we think back to talking about protein structure. What happens to proteins when I heat them up? Denature, right? So cells don't always have control of their environment, right? You put your cell, you put your hand on a hot, uh, stove, you've just uh, fried some cells, right? Wouldn't it be nice if the cells had some sort of ability to respond to and deal with that, right? Well, if you really fry your hand, you're not going to you're going to kill cells. But there's an intermediate phase, an intermediate phase where the the cell may be able to recover from that. All right. In a bacterium, especially, that's very important. Bacterium doesn't have anybody else to rely on. Everybody for themselves. But even you have this thing built into you that you can respond to heat shock. So if you were to respond to heat shock, what would be the first thing that you'd want to do? What's that? Pull well, pull away, but that's, that's, a, that's a nerve response. But at, but at a molecular level, what would, you, what would you expect that cells would need to do to be able to recover from heat shock? To do what? Well, but yeah, and that's, that's an approach. But what do cells want to do? I mean, a cell doesn't have that ability to do that. What is a cell? I'm a cell. I want to live. A lot of my